With us tonight is Randy Shaw, who's the director of the Tenderloin Housing Clinic and has been so for 25 years. He's also a journalist, a writer, editor of beyondcron.org, and many books, including one I think is getting little of attention right now called The Activist Handbook. You wrote that how many years ago? In, it came out in 96 originally well, and reissued in 2001. I'm hearing more about it lately. What's happened that, that, that this book is, is, is getting, did you write a new preface or something? Well, it might have raised some issues around homelessness and quality of life issues and what priority of homeless advocates should be. I, that is discussed. I discussed the Agnos approach to homelessness yes. and, the, and, the, and the backlash with Frank Gordon. I want to go back to that and we may start there, but I want for some of the people who don't know you, others do, uh, to uh, try and understand uh, who you are. Uh, some say you're one of the most powerful people in San Francisco, and you always come on self-facing and, and, and wonderful, uh, uh, dis, uh, detached approach to politics. But it's in your book, because I read it. <laughs> I read parts of it. You advocated for exactly what you've done, which is to be heavily involved in politics, to be, to be very proactive in the media, to frame the issues, to, to have strange alliances even with your enemies, to be totally, if you're going to make change as a nonprofit director of the housing clinic you're, you're involved with, you predicted you'd be doing all this, so people should have been surprised. Well, I would say that, you know, what I find more rewarding is starting around 1980 or 81, we were pushing, I was, I and others were pushing for a model of dealing with homelessness, which was to take the SROs, which were being used for Single nightly, resident the residential hotels, hotels, which are being used for this crazy hotline program that Mayor Feinstein created, and we kept saying, make it permanent housing, and now with the leasing program, which started in the 90s that I was a big advocate for, and then we, my organization became the main leasing, leaser of hotels. That's what uh, you do. And then Care Not Cash built on that. And so what we've done in San Francisco is taken the SROs, improved them, made them beautiful, restored them to historic splendor, and housed homeless people. And so my vision of what I'd like to see in 1980 has really come to pass. Let's go back, though. Let's go back to Camp Agnes, which is in the, in the, uh, in the chapter I read on homelessness in your book called The Activist Handbook. Um, for our, many of our uh, viewers who are not here, uh, let's just quickly go back to show how that set off all kinds of things, set it up for us, and, and what happened. Well, what happened was, you know, Art Agnos did redirect homeless policy, and in fact, redirect it to where we are Mayor now. Art Agnos. Mayor Art Agnos, when he came in in 1988, redirected homeless policy in a focus on permanent solutions. Uh, he personally believed that until he had certain institutions in place, that it would be not be right to rouse people off the street. So when people started pitching tents in Civic Center Plaza, Civic Center Park, he felt that until he had these multi-service centers up and running, he, he really, it would be wrong for him to just throw these people out, make them leave because he had no place to put them. Unfortunately, it led to a significant backlash as all the people who worked at City Hall or had to go to City Hall, and at that time the courts were in City Hall. So you had a lot of people who had to travel to and from City Hall and mm. they said, why are all these people, why do we have a tent city here? And although the mayor had a personal standard, it, it, it led to such a backlash that when Frank Jordan, a former police chief, ran against him, it became the sense of, here we have this ex-social worker becoming mayor who can't really handle the quality of life problems of homeless people. Let's go back to the same incident, though, from your book's point of view and what you recommend to activists. You reprimanded a lot of the, co uh, the uh, homelessness advocates for certain actions they took and it sort, of, it sort of shows best what you were trying to recommend to social activists and progressives. Uh, go back now to the same thing. Didn't they flood that camp with, uh, with their own campers? Well, yeah, it, there was a, I think there was uh, a lack of recognition of where the public was on that issue. And I think they kind of exacerbated. Agnos became pilloried by, you know, he was being pilloried by conservatives, but then you have the, the, some of the homeless activists basically saying everyone should have the right to pitch a tent. And I think that, you know, I, I argue in the book that, that homelessness was all about the right to housing in America where people should not be, under the, people who want housing should be able to get it. To argue instead that people should have, who, who, even, who could tur have the right to turn down housing and potentially p pitch a tent on a street or in a park is not a politically popular view. It's not, a, it's not, a, it doesn't really make much sense. But to according to your theories that in the book, I mean, you use that as an example of what not to do. Right. And I, I use it as an example of arguing on your opponent's terms. That mm -hmm. basically, 
in, in the people were put on the defensive and they argued on the terms. So instead of the debate being about there's no housing for people, it became do you have the right to pitch a tent in a public park? And on that issue, most people said no, and the homeless advocate shouldn't have espoused the yes position because it made no sense to people. Most people don't think and they that were breaking the rules that you set out, which is also the way to control the not control media but control the message. Set frame you frame the debate. You don't just right. make news, but to frame the debate. Correct. And also, uh, you you know you 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 do believe that protests the policy change is much stronger than protests or any one single protest. You should be going for the core of it, which is why you advocate and do get involved with ballot measures. Yeah, and what I said was, you know, protest is fine if it has some a result, I mean, right. but that just to do something to protest without a, a it's, it's part of an overall strategy. And tell and me, you you set out and you set out to to be totally involved in the ballot process, changing policy, right. whether it's through the politicians that you were related to, if not to the ballot, and you went to the ballot, and you show on several occasions you, you and your group, did change major policy issues in well, San Francisco. Well, if you look at, throughout the 80s, uh, tenants never achieved their major legislative goals because they kept trying to get things through the legislature and to the mayor, and then finally you realize that wasn't the way to go, and that he just go directly to the voters, and in 92 we did a ballot measure which has been the biggest transfer of wealth from landlord to tenant in the history of San Francisco because it cut the annual rent increase by more than half. And, you know, we did that by appealing to homeowners and economic fairness and the like. And before 92, the word in San Francisco was tenants can never win a ballot measure. Since 92, it's tenants can never can lose never a ballot, ballot measure. measure. So, so we sort of changed the dynamic, and it's just being a little more strategic and proactive instead of being too dependent on politicians. I have to ask you the, this question. Uh, in, in some circles, nonprofits like yours are more uh, almost or greater in power now under this group in City Hall than old developers and some of the old uh, establishment power circles. They're gone. They're not even around, or they've gone underground. Yeah, Do you well, agree with that? Well, not, it depends. Who, with, I mean, obviously, developers like Lennar are very powerful, and there's, yes. there's big ones. You know, I, I would say this, that in San Francisco, there is a huge nonprofit empire, so to speak, Thank that you. has more influence than probably, clearly, than any other city in America. Uh, there's no question about that. Part of that was... Uh, a strategy that Diane Feinstein used in the 80s, which was like she had a sort of corporatist real estate developer policies, but she kept her certain political people happy by giving money to nonprofit groups. And I think throughout, you've seen in San Francisco, groups get funded in San Francisco that do not get funded under Mayor Daley in Chicago. Mm -hmm. or have not gotten funded under Mayor Giuliani in uh, Los Angeles, in uh, New York City when he was there, or but, people like that. But, but, but when you combine your your techniques that you recommend, that is to go to the ballot box, to change policy that can result in more funding for nonprofits. Do you ever have a problem with a conflict of interest that well, you've charged the wealthy and power circles in the 80s with? Well, just to be clear, we've never, the Tenement Housing Clinic has never put a ballot measure on that brought us more money. In fact, ballot measures we've done have not brought us any money. Maybe so, not you, but other non non no, when, when nonprofits get involved in politics that can uh, result in in funding, whether it's a you know a new program or a new construction, uh, do you have a problem with that? Well, no, because if if it's a benefit program, if 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 we want to get more money for housing, and that if nonprofit housing groups are pushing for more housing Excellent money, and they example. might get some of that money. Okay. This is their mission. I mean, and actually, the individuals involved are not personally profiting. They want, you know, there's a belief in housing. Or if you're the Children's Initiative, is a good think example. That, don't you think that some individuals, for some individuals in the city do profit from some well, of those policies? Well, a lot of that, you know, a lot of the, there's far more patronage in San Francisco and other cities through the legislative process and the alloc, just the regular budget process, than there is through the ballot process. I mean, you know, yes. if you look at any, if you look at, at who works for the city and certain jobs and the connections they well, have. Well, I'm not denying you know, that it's it's permeating San Francisco. Yeah. I'm just saying, have the nonprofits basically just joined? I guess I, I think I think. Let me make. Yeah. There's a there's a very big point. Join you're the making. establishment. You're making a very absolutely. There's no question about it. I wish they were. That wasn't the case. There's no question that the idea. You know, there's a there's a, a phrase about this revolution will not be funded. About how in San Francisco, more than any city in America. People who are activists, and often people who consider themselves very left-wing activists, work for city-funded nonprofits. Correct. In other cities, they're in independent groups, and they don't—they're not connected to. You know, it's really different here than any other city in America. Okay, and also we also know that uh, by state federal law, a nonprofit, by its very nature, cannot be involved in. 
political campaigns. Well, you can be involved not for candidates. Not for right. candidates, but that's where the ballots come in. Right. Here. My point is, and especially in reading your book, what I got the impression was you wrote this in the, uh, about the 80s when you were a law student uh, at Hastings, I guess. Or you were at Hastings. No, I was already gone. When I wrote the book, I was already a lawyer for a long time. Well, you're already a lawyer, but you, you started, you started uh, organizing right. the Tenderloin at that right. time. That all, well, I guess it's almost 25, 27 years later, you, not the Republicans, they're long and endangered species, but you are the establishment. And I'm wondering, as we go back to homelessness, I'm going to ask you to try to be open-minded that some of the things you said then, now that you're the establishment, you control policy. That isn't it time to, do you have the ability to really say we were wrong here and we've got to go a well, new direction uh, here? Let me, let me just clarify something other. Uh, I, I can speak for myself. I certainly don't control policy. I mean, really, I mean, we're well, a contractor with the city, but I can tell you, I'm not in the room when the mayor is making decisions about policies. No, but you'd have to all. admit that. You'd have to admit not just your organization, but your organization, along with other organizations, have an, uh, they have the impact, well, especially I, with this Board of Supervisors. I, well, I would say this. Well, the Board of Supervisors has not been that involved in homeless policy. I would say that, that in terms of like how the leasing program came about, there's no question that I argued to Willie Brown that we should do that when he was mayor. No question. We can make our views known, but in this administration... Uh, I think you don't to say that nonprofits are the establishment. I, I, I'd say that nonprofit input is solicited, but I wouldn't necessarily. But call I believe it your philosophy and what you believe. So remember, in your book, you went after a, a, a co-authors. One of them was Bloom, called "The Truth About Homelessness." Right. What they said is what we're hearing now: that the group that is now on the streets don't just need a permanent house; they need substance right. abuse treatment. Right. Many of them are mentally ill. Right. When you wrote about that book, you said this was just a ploy of the right. Well, well let's be very clear. Let's be, well, hold this on. This is a ploy right. of the right, right to basically stigmatize this Correct. group. Correct. And that was and avoid we're housing. We're talking about people writing about the homeless population in the early 80s. Right. I will tell you, there's a dramatic difference in the homeless population in the last five years. Dramatic difference. Thank you. But that's what I meant. You have become, it's changed. You become part of the establishment in the sense that you have a, a role and you're doing, a, I believe... We're a, implementing the you city do a policies. Certain part, you right. do a certain policy. Correct. You we house implement a, them. You right. house a certain group of the population. Right. Are you prepared now to admit what was said then in the 80s? Oh, there's, ap, well, hold on. Absolutely, the population has changed. And, and that's, I think, the mayor, real, everyone kind of realizes is that what we've done in San Francisco, and this is not true for every city, it's, but it's true for San Francisco, is that is, you know, the percentage of people who are homeless now, the percentage that have drug and alcohol or mental health problems is significantly high. When I always get to tell the story. The people who are homeless in the, in the eight, er, late 80s and early 90s, that was because of the deindustrialization and all the loss of jobs. These, I know some of these people. They never were homeless again, you know. But the people who we see in Care Not Cash, they're not getting a job anytime soon. I mean, they've got a lot of problems. It's a much more needy population because, you know, we've been more successful in having permanent housing programs now. So I think, I think there's a, a recognition. That's why it's harder and more is expensive there, to house. Is there, okay, uh, but, and, and uh, you and I have talked, uh, when you look at some of the treatment that's required for uh, schizophrenics and other bipolar diseases, when you look at, for example, treatments at, at uh, Tescadero, the drugs have to often be taken every three or four hours. You know, it's not enough just to put them in a room and have a counselor down in the lobby. We're talking about a kind of treatment. Has the community, the Coalition on Homelessness and others in your field, begun to say, we reached the wall, we have to come up with more creative ideas? Well, let's be clear. Or are we run out of wanna, money? I can't speak for other groups. I can just say Randy that all the, all the mental health groups that I know, Yes. I mean, the state of California does not adequately fund mental health services. And, and that's been true for, for 40 years. And so when you but don't Laura's have... But law has you, not been funded in San Francisco and the money is available. No, there's no money available. No, 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 that's a myth. And, and the fact I've is... I've had three, no, three individuals on there. They misinformed you because there's no money. And in fact, this is the problem. It's so expensive as the population that's that causes right. the most disruptions that's on right. the street that the state government for 40 years has said... We're not going to do it. Okay. And so... We're not going to well, do my it. Point is so, that's that's the, so, so here's what happens. You get down to this level... And mayors face this situation. Mayors say, we don't have the resources to provide the kind of 24-hour care that these folks need. I agree. And good no which neighborhood are you going to put that facility in in right, San Francisco? But, but what I'm asking so here's what they do. So they, so they cite them. They, you know, use the criminal justice system. But what I'm system. asking you is, what, are, what is you as the activist that, w that had the passion in the 80s, who wrote the book, who succeeded in creating an organization that houses a certain population of homelessness successfully, what do you think... 
we are going to do when a democratically controlled state well, and a democratically controlled city government and a democratically controlled Congress, that's where the money is, will all say no to more funding. I don't think that'll happen. And in fact, I wrote a second book, it came out in 99, called Reclaiming America, which argued that the, you can't solve local problems without dealing with the national level. And what we've had is a federal government that has starved us, never addressed homelessness. Bill Clinton did not address homelessness. Exactly. Bill, but there, Bill Clinton was a disaster for the homeless then, population. Then what, what I'm saying is, are there any other solutions? You think there are no other solutions but more money coming from the federal level? Well, is that because, what you're saying? Well, no, I said the state government's also abandoned mental health. I mean, mental health, I mean, let me just tell you this. In, everyone has this widespread view that Ronald Reagan closed the mental health, mental, you know what, mental institutions and never refunded it? In this new book on Jesse Unruh that came out, I actually got the truth. It was almost a unanimous vote of the Democratic election. That's Everyone right. Voted. All Reagan did was sign Jesse Unruh's bill, but then nobody wanted to fund it because when it came time to, okay, where are we going to put these facilities? The community-based facilities. Right. No, no community wanted them. Okay. And also remember, yeah. that all began with the ACLU requiring, the uh, forcing. Well, the actually, SD. yeah, right, right. But I'm saying there was not a political debate. It wasn't like you had Reagan saying, I'm going to close Thank these you, mental Randy institutions. Shaw. I have had so many people here who always bring up that regular well, thing. It's That's wrong. the truth. Yeah. But the fact is, no Democratic group and no Republican group has funded the community centers that were that supposed to replace that is these correct. huge prisons-looking type of facilities. You're right. Um, I'll tell you, uh, l l we're going to sample one thing. Yeah. A lot of people, I've had this, it drives me crazy, people don't know, when Bill Clinton was president for eight years, mm -hmm. we lost public housing units, and it was only in the last two years of his administration we had any gains in Section 8. He was a disaster in dealing with homelessness. You know, people keep, I mean, people seem to not know that. It mm -hmm. seems to be just forgotten. We need to have someone who's, a, you know, we have to push the next president to fund these programs. Let's talk pol politics now. Uh, you wrote a recent uh, piece at your, uh, at your site about uh, how the board, I mean, you and I, again, a lot of viewers don't remember, budget crises. This is what generated the politics, the churning, great new stuff of San Francisco politics for the last 20 years. Yeah. But we haven't had it because we have... Uh, that's circuit. correct. So now we're headed into, a, a, I think, a real one. Has the board accepted that, that this is a real deficit? Yes, but you know, one thing about our deficit, it's primarily caused by the state cuts. Correct. And so, you know, it's, it's not like San Francisco. So when, when that's the case, San Francisco is somewhat limited what we can do because to raise revenue, you have to have a ballot measure, which never seems to pass. And so the options for us raising revenue, it isn't like, okay, we're running over budget, we'll lay off these. We have to, we'll have to lay off people, but it's the state cuts. Now the state budget seems to be getting worse and worse and worse. And so it's the extent to which the state's going to make major cuts in our health programs, the social services, and other kind that we're going to then have to try to backfill. But what I'm saying, do they accept this is a I legit, think they do, yes. Okay, so we begin with the fact we have a healthy deficit, which always then leads to these battles. And you're saying in this recent article that you do see the beginnings of the final eruption of a building um, antagonism yes. between the mayor's office and the board. Yes. Okay, tell us... What do you think is going to happen? Are you thinking these ballot measures that are coming up are kind of proxies for this, and how serious is the rift? Well, I think that, you know, the mayor, I think there's one thing interesting about our, our mayor uh, is, is he, he almost doesn't, he likes to be against other people. It's like he, he needs that somehow because, you know, these conflicts that have been created, I mean, you know, he and Peskin were on the same side of Prop A, the, the Muni measure last, and then suddenly, as soon as the election ends, Suddenly, he's attacking Peskin over Prop 8. Uh, Adam, what do you, you know, think? Why does he do well, that? Well, it was, it was the, the most common argument is just what's been said is that Donald Fisher, who was a big opponent of Prop A and is tight with the mayor, was unhappy that the mayor ended up supporting Prop A and was unhappy that Peskin was, defeated him. And so to get back, at, you know, he told the mayor, go after this guy because he's attacking me. Uh, so it's, it's, they see Donald Fisher's hand here. But we're heading into a budget thing where the mayor, in the last few years, the board and the mayor have worked things out. But this year, if the mayor is, is basically drawing lines in the sand, as he seems to do, and, and issue, it, he's just basically get, you know, wants to sort of provoke a fight, uh, possibly because of the board elections, the supervisor in November, and the mayor may feel he'll run a slate of candidates, and then he'll use the budget thing as saying, pick my slate. It may be that his consultants are telling him, pick an issue that can become the, uh, a, a rallying cry for the November uh, supervisor elections. What about beyond? 
Well, I personally, I've said this for a while. I think Mary Newsom's primary focus now is being elected governor. But I is think, he? I think that's what he's focused on. Has the framing of the his daily schedule and Absolutely. issues begun already? Oh yeah, it's all about greening. I mean, there was a press conference in Bayview. There, there, every I get all his press every single day almost. There's a press conference on the mayor on something to do with greening. I think he has tapped into a sentiment. He thinks California, this is where they want to go. I think you know he's 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 aligning himself up to be a very strong candidate and probably win. Uh, this whole you know, greening and energy and, and global warming and you know tying that in with the, the gay marriage stuff and he's got you know a major part and, and his alliances with labor, he's got you know a major part of the Democratic constituency. Did you say? I thought you said he probably would win. I, I think he will. I think I, if I had to bet on anyone being the next governor, I'd say he's the best bet. Okay. Uh, now you've also seem to have a, a strong interest in the presidential race without getting into the specifics. What do you think the overall uh, impact is of the battle within the Democratic Party and, and which way is it going and, and what, is, what, are the, what, what are the two possible outcomes? Well, I, I, think this, I, I think it's quite clear that Barack Obama will be the nominee and I think Barack Obama is going to go down and, and very easily beat John McCain. It's not going to even be a close election. And I, and I think the real issue is in my lifetime, uh, my adult lifetime, sorry, Never have had a president that is uh, like Barack Obama. I mean, the closest president Democrats would have to look at, and you have to look at Lyndon Johnson, who had all kinds of different Wouldn't baggage. Was more like Jimmy Carter? No, 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 not at all. I, I wrote a piece about how he's not like Jimmy Carter at all, completely different. Jimmy Carter was, always, was never part of the Democratic Party. Barack Obama is strongly supported by the core constituencies of the Demo uh, Labor is, is strongly. Carter was never aligned with labor. He was a guy from Plains, Georgia, who only won because of Watergate, and he barely won. Uh, I think we're looking at the closest to Barack Obama, really, is Franklin Roosevelt in 32. I don't think there's anything in between. Okay, but, you know, you heard, we heard the, these kinds of things said when Pelosi and the Democrats took back Congress. No, there, there was that sense of now we control Congress and the Senate, U.S. Senate, and things will be different. And I don't think, uh, based on the ratings they're getting, I don't think anything changed. Well, it's because you can't, you don't, Democrats never really control the Senate because Joe Lieberman was kind of a deciding vote and, and you didn't, never had a, you never had a real strong majority in the Senate uh, to deal with the Iraq the, war I think and stuff like that. that. Well, and I think, I think you'll see a the president controls so much uh, and the Demo as I say, the Democrats, you know, with Joe Lieberman being the, you know, even match and he can defect the Republicans and you lose control of the Senate. So they you didn't have a word. The, uh, let me get this. Yeah. There's a phrase that Barack Obama has used throughout which is he needs to have, you need to have a working majority. Right now, Democrats have a working majority in the House. They do not have a working majority in the Senate. I think if you have a Democratic president, I think if we have a situation, like we had in 93, with, but we had a bad president. You know, we had Bill well, Clinton. Yeah, but, you, you know, you, you want the perfect. No, no, no. The, but he yeah. was a Democrat. Well, not all Democrats are the same. It's like no Republicans are the same. Right, but you had control of the Senate, I right. believe. We didn't take back the, the House for two years. 93. Yeah, you had 93, you had, yeah. All three. But you had a president... Who, and this is the difference, who is not backed by labor when he won 92, who is not aligned with core he, constituencies. He wouldn't have won push without him. labor, would he? Uh, he didn't, no, labor really wasn't that powerful in 93, 92 elections. So, I mean, the difference is... Why do you is, think labor is more powerful now? Well, ever since 95 with Sweeney coming in and the whole, labor is far more politically mobilized after 95. So the point is, Bill Clinton, all he ever wanted to do was be president. I never got the sense that he cared that much. He ran a very populist campaign. Then as soon as he gets in office, okay, says, so what, what do you think? Uh, first of all, uh, we only have a couple more minutes yeah. left. I want you to try to finish up on that question. What do you think the impact, though, is uh, uh, as a, uh, the bru a grueling uh, primary season? I, I think what, what happen happens is after Hillary endorses Obama, everyone's happy and, and he wins and easily. And she gets uh, all her supporters would move. To I think so, yeah. Okay. What do you really think will be different uh, with a Democratic president, Democratic Congress, uh, Democratic uh, state assemblies. Well, I think US. I think it'll be dramatically different because well, I think Barack you, Obama will say, I think he'll move on health care. I think he'll move on labor rights. I think our foreign policy will be dramatically different. We'll have a lot more money available because the Iraq thing will be winding down. But he has not. Well, I don't want to get into that. that we got to avoid that. But what I'm saying, in other words, you think there'll be actual, real, substantial changes in what? What areas? No, I think in everything. I mean, I think it'll be a dramatic change, far more than what we saw when Bill Clinton was elected, because it's different constituency. Barack Obama is the first Democrat. Really, you could say since '32 to be elected from the core base. Uh, Bill Clinton got you know we have to pick a southerner and we have to pick a conservative and he has to be he's going to triangulate. There's no thought of that around Barack Obama. He is a solid core progressive Democrat. He doesn't shy away from it. 
and I think you're going to see a different agenda. He wants to move things. He's from urban America. Think of it. The Democrats never picked anyone from urban America since Roosevelt in 32, oh, we, we, you, you know, in terms of presidents. We've oh. had people from Plains, Georgia, or Arkansas. Mm -hmm. There was a time where you had the uh, Democratic governor, Democratic assembly, Democratic state, uh, state well, senate. Well, I think, you know, in, and ca it didn't in California. Seem to, yeah, in California. You know, Gray Davis was obviously not very politically astute. You know, a lot of good things happened during the Gray Davis uh, administration that, that don't get much attention. A lot of good things happened. And, and I think that, you know, unfortunately he was the bad, you know, he just didn't have any personal skills. Okay, coming back to San Francisco. Are there, uh, what are the impacts on San Francisco with either one of the current candidates uh, uh, for president of the Democratic Party? Well, it brings more money. I mean, basically, it's money that more money comes for housing, more money comes for health, more money comes. It, it being more, now, it's not going to be a tremendous amount of money in the first couple of years because we'll still be having some troops in Iraq. But after the, the troops from Iraq are withdrawn and we have money to spend on programs, uh, I think it makes a difference. And I think, on the I think San Franciscans themselves are so focused on this national race because they care about the environment. They care about there'll be money for environmental initiatives. I mean, I think you're going to see. It's almost like Nirvana you see coming. Well, not Nirvana. I see it. Well, given where we are with George I mean, Bush, it, it, I see it, it, a dramatic improvement. It, it, what yes. I'm wondering is, I wish, here's what I'm wondering. You have, the, you have the, uh, the hope that was in your book, the same hope, and returning to the same theme that you are now older, and you now are a businessman, you're a developer, having developer problems, as you've, have, as you've shown with one of your projects. Uh, you know what all that's about. Yet you still have this hope that... Uh, it can make a difference. I mean, you have a complaint about Bill Clinton, a complaint about uh, the fact that you didn't control all of the, uh, the, the U.S. Senate right now. Uh, do you think you're being a little bit too optimistic? And that, well, you know I, the I reality of politics see, in San here's Francisco? Here's my confidence, and I've heard even Obama say this, is that in whatever level of government is kind of the theme of the activist handbook is you have to hold politicians accountable. If, 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 if Obama's elected and, and we've got Pelosi and Reid and they don't do anything and we just say, well, that's okay because they're Democrats, then obviously that doesn't work. But what right. you have to do is keep the base mobilized and the people who are out there on the streets working for these people have to then say, hey, we didn't work for you for nothing and we're going to criticize you if you're not doing what you're supposed to be doing. We'll so hold you gotta, to that. And that's, and that's what I've heard Obama say, hold me accountable. And that's what we've got to do. And that's the next challenge. After we I hope November. he just doesn't say, sorry, didn't work out. Randy Shaw, thanks for spending 30 minutes with us. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you for joining us, and we'll see you next time. Visit our website at www.sfunscripted.com.